let's continue our discussion on blood and specifically what we're going to focus on in this video are the leukocytes, otherwise known as white blood cells, which play a huge part in our immune system. And since we'll be talking about the immune system, we'll touch on the lymphatic system as well, because the lymphatic system and these white blood cells coordinate, coordinate with each other to keep our bodies safe and rid our bodies of any pathogens or foreign organisms trying to do harm. Okay, so just a quick review of blood. What we've talked about is the majority of blood is the blood plasma, which is the fluid component. After that, we have the red blood cells. The percentage of red blood cells within our blood is known as hematocrit. And the third component is the buffy coat, which is composed of white blood cells and platelets. And together, those make up less than 1% of the total volume of our blood. Even though it's less than 1%, these white blood cells and certainly the platelets are going to play a very significant part in maintaining homeostasis of our body. On our list, let's take a look at the first leukocyte on our list. And that is what is known as a neutrophil. It is the most prevalent of all leukocytes, making up roughly 65% of our leukocytes within circulation. It engages in phagocytosis, which is the process of engulfing material, infected cells or pathogens and breaking those entities down. It also releases toxins like superoxide. And to be clear, uh, superoxide alone is not the toxin. The toxin is actually hydrogen peroxide. But upon the release of superoxide, it combines with hydrogen ions within the blood and surrounding connective tissue to actually destroy any pathogens or infected cells. In doing so, it is going to lead to the demise of these neutrophils as well. And one thing we want to talk about is the lifespan of all leukocytes, which tend to be around seven to 10 days. And the process of making white blood cells is known as leukopoiesis. Collectively, we talked about hematopoiesis being the production of all blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets, which to be clear, we call formed elements. But the process of making more leukocytes is leukopoiesis. Okay, so then we have eosinophils. Eosinophils make up a very small percentage, roughly 3% of all leukocytes in circulation. They get activated during allergic reactions, parasitic infections, parasites are things like giardia, plasmodium that causes malaria, tapeworms, among other things. So I'm giving you percentages of these white blood cells. And those percentages are important because if a blood panel is run on an individual and those percentages are elevated, it's going to be a first indication to the medical professionals what the problem may be with the patient. That is to say, if eosinophils are now making up 15% of all the white blood cells in circulation, then they can focus their, their search or investigation on some sort of parasitic infection or allergy. We also have basophils, which is another type of leukocyte, makes up 5% of leukocytes in circulation. They release histamines, which cause vasodilation and increase capillary permeability. So if you can envision capillaries, capillaries have fenestrations or pores in them that allow certain entities to leave the bloodstream and move into the interstitial fluid and the surrounding cells. There are a number, number of entities, specifically plasma proteins, that cannot squeeze through those pores. But one, what basophils do is they increase the permeability by expanding the size of the pores, and then plasma proteins can sneak into the interstitial fluid, and that is going to aid in inflammation due to the accumulation of fluid 
with that within that interstitial space. So histamines increase capillary permeability, and they're also causing vasodilation in a specific area of the body. So the vasodilation is going to increase blood flow to a specific area. And then with the increased capillary permeability is how inflammation occurs. Basophils are also secreting a natural anticoagulant known as heparin. So coagulation is the clumping up of blood that is useful if there's some sort of hemorrhage, but that's the only time we want blood to kind of slow down and start clumping together. So heparin is really important because we need a constant flow of blood and perfusion of oxygen throughout the whole body. Okay, this right here is a monocyte. It's prevalent during inflammation and viral infections. Once it leaves the bloodstream, it's referred to as a macrophage. So flowing through the blood within the plasma, it's known as a monocyte. And its activity is phagocytosis, which I talked about a minute ago. And that is engulfing and breaking down either foreign debris, old decrepit tissue, infected cells, or foreign pathogens. Okay, what I want to touch on for a minute here is specific types of immunity, and this one is what's known as innate immunity. So our immune system can be broken down into innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate is the type of immunity we are born with. Adaptive is something that must be developed upon exposure to specific organisms or pathogens. So innate immunity involves all the cells we've talked about thus far, the neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, among some others that I haven't talked about. So for example, there are dendritic cells in the epidermis of the skin that are known as Langerhans cells. These are a type of phagocytic cell. There are also natural killer cells, which is a type of lymphocyte. But all these cells I've just mentioned play a part in the innate immunity. They are in our body at the moment of birth, and they will, they will not discriminate against specific organisms or pathogens that have entered the body. So they are going to attempt to rid the body of these foreign organisms. Part of the innate immunity as well are, are reactions such as a fever, which is meant to make the environment in a, inhospitable to foreign organisms. Inflammation, which I talked about just previously, is another form of innate immunity. The other form of immunity is adaptive, and that develops over time upon exposure to specific pathogens. And that is really the realm of types of cells known as lymphocytes. To be clear, natural killer cells are a type of lymphocyte but they play a part in the innate immunity. So the two types of lymphocytes that are the workhorses for the adaptive immune system are T cells and B cells. There are a number of different types of T cells. There are cytotoxic T cells, which di directly destroy infected cells. So to be clear, not all lymphocytes are actually destroying infected cells or destroying pathogens. They all have their own role in this adaptive immunity. So cytotoxic T cells are going to be activated when we are infected with viruses, bacteria, parasites, and they will directly destroy infected cells. So those are our own body cells, but it's important that those, our body cells are destroyed so these viruses or bacteria are not replicating in the body. There's helper T cells, which do not kill, but they are there really just to mobilize our immune system and the other T cells. We have regulatory T cells, which suppress our immune system. So we don't want our immune system to be overactive. And there are a number of diseases and pathologies that are a result of autoimmune diseases where our immune system is attacking our own body cells, our own healthy body cells. So our regulatory T cells are there to suppress excessive immune activity. 
And then we have memory T cells, which retain some sort of knowledge or identification of pathogens that we have previously been infected with. So if we are infected with, say, SARS COVID-19, we develop some sort of immunity to it because we have these memory cells in our body that recognize that virus when it enters our body, body at a subsequent time, a year later, two years later. Now, certainly these memory cells have differing levels of robusticity. That is to say, some of them die out and we lose our memory for these pathogens. But theoretically, these memory cells will be within our immune system, within our body for a long period of time. Okay, so also related to the immune system is a system known as the lymphatic system, which is somewhat hard to differentiate or separate or tease out from the immune system. But the lymphatic system includes fluid, which is known as lymph, which is similar to blood plasma without the plasma proteins, vessels, which are similar to our veins, though different, known as lymphatic vessels, and specific organs and tissues that are working within the realm of the lymphatic system. And those would be the red bone marrow where hematopoiesis takes place, and certainly pertaining to this discussion, leukopoiesis takes place, the production of more red blood cells, excuse me, the production of more white blood cells, there's a thymus gland, which tends to degenerate during adulthood, but the thymus gland is the site for lymphocyte maturation, the maturation of T cells and B cells. The lymphocyte is located immediately posterior to the sternum, anterior to the aortic arch. We have lymph nodes that activate T cells and B cells and filter lymph, the tonsils, we have three sets of tonsils, lingual tonsils, palatine tonsils, and pharyngeal tonsils that are aggregations of lymphocytes to help surveil the body of any foreign organisms or pathogens trying to do harm. The spleen, which is in the upper left quadrant of the abdominal cavity, is a place where red blood cells are broken down and recycled, or at least some of their parts are recycled. And that happens in a region of the spleen known as the red pulp. There is a region known as white pulp that has a number of lymphocytes and macrophages that monitor the lymph fluid that passes through there. Those are our leukocytes, lymphatic system, and immune system.